Greetings, everyone. Today we're going to start our head unit for clinical anatomy. We're going to start by looking at the scalp, the face, and the nose. So here, like usually, you can rely off your clinical objectives. Uh, use those for studying and guiding what you learn from these lectures. Now, when we look at the external anatomy of the face and the scalp, you can technically divide it up into these 14 regions here. I won't expect you guys to know those regions. I think those are just kind of a good um, marking point, and they help underline identify the underlying structures that you see. Uh, and so once you kind of get an understanding of the bones and the, the musculature, these regions will make a lot more sense, but I will never test you on any of these. So instead, let's go ahead and just break down uh, what is the actual scalp. So we're all probably somewhat familiar with the scalp uh, as far or as where it is, uh, but the scalp is the structure, basically the skin and everything underlying it that overlays what we call the neural cranium. Now we'll go into the skull component in a later lecture, but here we can kind of look at the basics. So this is all kind of part of your neural cranium. It's kind of the, the skull part of the skull. Uh, the visiocranium is the facial component. So when we look at the scalp, uh, the anterior border is gonna be what's known as the supraorbital margin or ridge. So kind of the top of your eyebrows. And then posteriorly, and I know this is white on white, so I apologize for that. Maybe I can put an overlay in here. Uh, there's a nuchal line on the orbital mar uh, bone, or sorry, the occipital bone, uh, and that's going to mark the posterior region of the scalp. Laterally, sorry, I clicked that there. Uh, laterally, you can see these zygomatic arches, um, and those make up the lateral borders on either side. So that all comprises our scalp region. Now, the scalp is really just a, a name for the overlying uh, skin and uh, connective tissue over our skull. And the nice thing about it is it's got a really easy acronym to remember, and it's scalp. So let's take a look at what that means. So we start with S, which is skin. So you can see the top layer here is our skin, followed by connective tissue. And this is dense connective tissue, not to be confused with loose connective tissue later. Um, we have aponeuroses, and you can see the aponeuroses from our occipital muscle and our frontal muscle for our occipital frontalis muscle. Um, that aponeuroses is going to make up our uh, third layer. Then we have some loose connective tissue, which is essentially just fatty tissue. And then finally, so, um, the final layer is the P, the pericranium. Uh, so that's kind of the outer portion of our skull. Uh, so that'll help you remember what makes up the actual scalp. Uh, there's not a lot going on. We will talk about how the scalp gets uh, sensory innervation. But other than the um, frontal uh, occipital, sorry, occipital frontalis muscle, there's really not a lot of musculature or anything going on in the scalp region. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the face. Um, so the face is really just everything else, right? So we talked about the neural cranium, and then this is going to be the visual cranium on the skull. Uh, and again, we're going to get into more skull anatomy later on. But our uh, boundaries of the face is pretty much everything on the anterior aspect. It goes from ear to ear, so, and then goes from chin to hairline, right? Uh, so that's it. So when we take a look at uh, what's going on in the face, we're going to look at the external structures first. So let's take a look at the muscles of facial expression. Uh, these are all going to be innervated by the facial nerve, which we'll take a look at in uh, a little more detail. And everything I've started here are kind of the ones I want you to, to focus on, and I've outlined those in a little bit more detail. So we'll just basically go through and, and talk about the muscles um, and what they do. And you should be comfortable with their actions, not so much their origins and insertions. And why is that? Because a lot of these muscles actually insert in very unusual areas. So you guys are used to learning about how a muscle will insert from either uh, a tendon or a part of the bone uh, to another tendon part of the bone structure, right? So it's kind of acting on bones. Well, because of these are muscles of facial expression, what we want to do is manipulate the skin. So a lot of these insertions are actually going to be on skin components. And so that means um, it just makes it a little more difficult to really assess where the origins and insertions are. And honestly, I don't think it's that helpful in memorizing the, muscle, the musculature. Uh, I think you're better off um, identifying the, um, the structures here or what they actually do, the actions. So let's go with our occipital frontalis. We already talked about that. That's that muscle on the top here, right? And we saw the aponeuroses is going to be the A part of our scalp uh, acronym. So you have a portion on the back right there and a portion on the front. And what this does, so in um, we have probably a lot more control. You're used to using this for the frontal, uh, frontal component, right? Um, when we want to like wrinkle our eyebrows kind of in a, a sense of uh, like, oh, really? Um, and I'm going to try to do these uh, animations and hopefully you can see, I think the, the definition of the camera is not amazing. But uh, basically, if I want to just kind of like be surprised by something, 
that's the frontalis, and I'm thinking too hard about it. It's like, oh, look at that. Um, there's no anatomy exam next week or something. Um, so that would be your frontal component. Uh, the occipital, uh, it just kind of helps support that. Um, we don't really wrinkle the back of our, our skull uh, or scalp too much. So really what that's going to do is pull on the frontalis muscle and help lift those fibers up and give us that more surprise to look. So this guy's doing a lot better job than I can do. Okay, so the next muscle that we'll look at is the avicularis oculi. Now this muscle is basically just a, a ring around the eye here. So if you were to dissect out your face, uh, and I think we do have some good images of facial dissections, so uh, I will say this is one thing that's very um, difficult or uh, stressful for students is trying to dissect out face muscles, and they usually don't turn out so well. It takes just a lot of time because they're invested into the underlying um, skin. A lot of times when you're skinning, you're just pulling off those muscles. So um, kind of a stress you guys don't have to worry about at this moment, but at least uh, it's easy to see in these images, and we'll, we'll have some good facial dissections. But uh, the abicularis oculi uh, is very similar to the abicularis uh, oris, so these face, uh, muscles around uh, those structures, whether it's the eye for oculi or the mouth for oris. Um, and then what you can imagine these doing, so imagine those circular muscles just contracting at once, uh, and those help kind of like make everything a little more concentric. So in the case of the eye, it's going to close the eye. Now, it doesn't really close the, um, the eyelid part tightly, so if we just do it and kind of make like, close our eyes just like this, uh, that sort of soft close is our orbicularis oculi closing. And notice that you don't really have like a tightened, um, so you have to really force your eyelid to shut tighty, tightly, like if you get um, dust blown into your face or something like that, uh, you have to go a little bit extra mile. And those are some of our uh, uh, papillary muscles, or <clears throat> palpebrae muscles, which are muscles in our eyelids that are gonna help close those up a little bit tightly. But um, the orbital part, which is everything around that, so when we just kind of close and, and have a loose eyelid structure, that's our orbicularis oculi. Uh, muscle at work there. And you can also use it uh, one at a time, so if you want to do a winking uh, gesture, that's where the uh, bicularis oculi is going to come into play. All right, the corrugator supercilii. So this is going to be the one that uh, helps raise the eyelid, and uh, what you can see there is it's kind of like on the uh, medial aspect of our eye, uh, not quite in the center here, but it sort of just helps raise sort of the medial component of our eye. And I think this guy's doing a great example of, <laughs> right here. Uh, we just kind of get that skeptical look, showing worried or concern, um, especially if you're doing one. Uh, it helps with surprise if you do both. So remember our frontalis muscle basically doing the surprise. We can also get some of our corrugator supercilli functioning in that region. I'll do that, but uh, raising one individually gives that sort of um, concerned or worried look or the Huh, I'm not, I'm kind of skeptical of that. Uh, I, I like to think of it just based off the name. Uh, super silly, you can think super silly. So if somebody's doing, somebody's doing something super silly, they kind of raise your eyebrow in disbelief, like, huh. Um, and you guys can't see my eyebrow. <laughs> um, like raising it up. Again, I don't think my eyes are doing this thing justice, but let's let this gentleman here do uh, his uh, job for that. All right, so next let's take a look at the procerus. Uh, so the procerus is a muscle, it's kind of a, a singular muscle located on the um, bridge of your nose, right at the top there. Uh, so you can see that in this image. And this is a muscle of disdain or disliking. Uh, so when you see a movie that you don't like or you smell something gross, um, that's the procerus in, uh, procerus in action. Uh, so that's going to kind of give you this like wrinkled, um, like, ugh, like face kind of thing like that. Uh, separate that from the frontalis, which is raising both your eyelids. Uh, the procerus is kind of bringing everything together. Um, and again, this gentleman is doing it, so it sort of narrows the eyes um, and brings your upper brow down and your lower brow up, uh, whereas your front frontalis uh, and your corrugator supercilli bring every, just the eye, uh, upper brows up a little bit higher. So procerius is your muscle of disdain um, or dislike. Now let's take a look at the orbicularis oris. So this works very similarly to the abicularis oculi, which we saw around the eye there. Uh, and this one, like I mentioned earlier, wraps around the mouth. So it does a very similar structure. When you wrap around something, what you're doing is closing it together. And so in this case, as the gentleman uh, aptly demonstrates, it compresses our mouth and helps protrude our lips. So it doesn't go on the lips as much, so it helps kind of close and push those out. Um, 
so that kind of gets you ready for kissing. Uh, it also helps resist uh, distension and blowing. So if you're playing like a trumpet or uh, you're blowing spitballs out of a straw, it's your abicularis oris at work for those functions. All right, so next we'll take a look at the levator labii superioris. So this muscle is going to be um, one, it doesn't necessarily help with smiling, which is going to use the sides of our lips as much. This one's just going to help raise our uh, central components of our lip um, and kind of give another, similar to the procerus, help with that disdained look. And I'm, this lady's kind of doing a good example here. So she's just raising up the top part of her lip, so it's kind of like that, oh my gosh. And then you can see that her procerus is actually working too to kind of wrinkle up that um, the eyelids and the, the brow. So it kind of goes in assistance with that when you basically smell something or you, you forgot that you left some uh, old lasagna in the fridge for like two months and you just smell it, you're like, oh, what is that? Um, that's your levator uh, labii superioris. Uh, you can kind of see it here, but I'll actually step back and see um, it's this muscle right here just underneath the eye and see how it kind of approaches the midline there. Uh, that is your levator labii superioris. We'll follow that up with the zygomatis major and minor. So these are going to be two structures that are very similar. Let's see if I can pull them up here. Uh, yeah, so the ones on the lateral aspect here, that would be uh, your zygomatic major and minor is right over here. Major is going to be bigger, a little more lateral, and a little more superficial. The minor is going to be just deep to that. Um, now the minor, as you can imagine, is very close to the levator superior, uh, sorry, the levator labii superioris. Uh, so it has very similar function. So the only one that you really have to be mindful of uh, that's different is the major. And this gentleman's doing another good job where he's lifting up one side on the right here for his uh, zygomatic major, and it's giving this sneering look. So just think about that. It's kind of pulling up the lateral aspect of your lip. Uh, so if you just do one, it kind of gives it like this snicker, this kind of like, hmm, um, like you're up to no good or you're about to do something a little bastardly. Uh, but if you do both of them, then you get a smile. So I'm trying to do that. Yeah, I don't think I have good facial muscles apparently, so um, I'm not as expressive as this, uh, this gentleman. But... Uh, just think if you kind of get smiling, and there's multiple muscles that are going to be involved in smiling, uh, that would be your zygomatis major muscle lifting up part of the edge there. Uh, your buccinator is going to be a muscle of the cheek. Uh, let's see, you can kind of see that. Let's go back here. Uh, you can kind of see it right under here. but. Um, I think the first image that we have too for these facial structures will also help you kind of identify them. So let's go back real quick. This guy. So this kind of helps separate everything so you can at least identify the, in the individual muscles. Um, oops, my finger's way off. Uh, so the buccinator is going to be down here. Uh, you can see your um, levator superiori, um, uh, sorry, levator labii superioris, followed by your zygomatics. And then we'll get to the other ones too. But your buccinator is going to be this muscle that is uh, very prominent in people who play things like uh, brass instruments. So if you've ever seen people uh, like Louis Armstrong with uh, his big puffy cheeks, uh, you can imagine he has really powerful buccinator muscles. The reason for that is they actually help resist uh, blowing in your cheeks. So when you are chewing food, uh, it, the buccinator is what keeps your food kind of localized. So you're not just kind of leaving it in these pockets of your cheeks and getting little squirrel cheeks of you know, puffed out food. Um, but uh, on top of that, it also helps resist blowing. So this gentleman, giving us more facial expressions. So if you see the protruding lips, what muscle is it that gives protruding lips? Abicularis oris, right? So that helps kind of also resist blowing. Uh, and then the buccinator kind of uh, compounds on that. So people who do a lot of blowing, uh, kind of do, do a lot of like puffing with their cheeks. The buccinator is going to help kind of get reinforced and um, ultimately can get a little bit bigger because you're using it more. The Vader anguli oris is going to be on the lateral aspects of the mouth here. Uh, so you can kind of see in the, the image I got up here, and this one is labeled so it'll make it easier to kind of identify the other ones. Uh, this one helps widen the mouth, so it's another one that's helpful for smiling. Um, uh, you can do it as like a grimacing, just like the levator or the zygomatis major where if you just kind of lift up one, you kind of get this sneered, uh, sneering um, grimace. But if you do both sides, it's going to pull up the lateral aspects of your um, lips and give you that nice smile, It'll kind of widen your smile a little bit more than the zygomatis major would. All right, so next we'll look at the resorius. Uh, this is kind of the muscle of um, 
doubt, I guess you could call it. Uh, and this one's gonna be on the lateral aspect here. So it actually kind of pulls at the corners of the mouth and just kind of spreads the angle of your mouth a little bit wider on the lateral aspect. So it's sort of that, uh, that muscle that you use if you have a friend who's telling you some tall tale about how they had the best night of their life and they ended up getting free tickets to whatever and then whatever, I'm sure we all have that friend. Uh, and then you just kind of sit there skeptically like, mm -hmm, yep, that's the Rizorius at work there. Uh, kind of giving you the um, think Rizorius is to ridiculous. So if someone tells you a ridiculous story, use your Rizorius to be like, mm -hmm. Okay, so moving inferiorly, we have our depressor angular uh, oris. Now the one thing you might know, uh, muscles like to be named for what they do, right? So now we're starting to look at depressor and before we were looking at levator muscles. So levator muscles are going to help raise your lip or raise the part that they're attached with. Uh, whereas depressors are going to help lower it. So all these muscles that are depressors and the angular means it's going to be more in the lateral aspect and oris means mouth. So this is going to be um, kind of a, another one that helps with the um, it's not like a full-on sad face. You can kind of see this guy here. It's got like the pronounced like, oh, I'm sad, like woe is me. Um, it works with the Rosorius. So if you're kind of doing that wide stretch and then you actually have to add a little bit of a frown to it, that's your depressor anguli oris. So it's gonna, again, pull those lateral aspects of your uh, lips downward. The Depressor labii inferioris is gonna be a little more medially located. And this kind of helps um, really pull the chin open. So like if you start doing, uh, like if you get really, really sad or start doing a pout, like when kids do their little poutiness because you told them they can't you know, watch TV past 9 p.m. and they kind of like aptly have a kid here who's just like, oh my God, why can't I do that? And you just get the wrinkled chin um, down there. That's part of your depressor labii inferioris. And you can kind of see here, again, I would refer back to the, the main picture, but it's gonna be more towards the midline. So if you have your depressor, um, and maybe I can pull my skull up here. Nope, I don't have a mandible on it, so I can't do that. Um, but again, it's going to be more towards the midline. It's going to help pull the, the lips down and kind of give you more of a pronounced um, frown on your face. And then finally, the mentali mentalis. Uh, <clears throat> this is a muscle uh, that helps further protrude the lips, so it's going to be more centrally located, and it really kind of brings down the lips and helps pull up uh, the chin. So it really kind of gives you this like pouting look. Um, and you can see here how this gentleman, uh, it kind of pulls out his uh, lip almost completely. So it acts on that and it really just kind of elevates and helps bring that chin up. So it gives you a really pronounced sense of like, um, I guess you could say sadness. Uh, they say doubt. Uh, I don't know if I've ever make that kind of face when I say doubt or doubtful of things, but uh, that's the way it can go. But just think of mentalis um, and the mental region is usually the anterior aspect of your mandible. Uh, and that just basically pulls everything down here and just kind of gives this like wrinkled, pouty look like, why me, you know? All right, and then finally the platysma. Uh, this is just a fun muscle to say. Uh, and it's kind of a cool dissection because it's very superficial. Um, and so if students were to dissect this out, uh, you actually see it kind of invested in the um, adipose tissue of the neck. Uh, so when you're dissecting the neck, you actually come across this. So it's really hard to maintain intact. But this muscle is kind of like, uh, angst muscle, you know, so like uh, as you can see in this um, our little image over here, you start thinking about that exam that you have in two weeks you're like, oh gosh, I didn't study for that exam and you tense up your neck and you're just kind of like stressed out and that will be your platysma at work there and so it really just kind of helps to press your whole mandible and tighten up your neck region as well. So here's a nice review. Uh, this gentleman's going over all of them, kind of the multiple combinations of both. You should be comfortable with the facial expression muscles and kind of just generally what they do. Um, and think about their location and that kind of helps reinforce that. But again, I'm not gonna test you on origins versus insertions or expect you to know those for these muscles. Uh, instead, I would rather just know like, okay, if I'm uh, surprised what kind of muscles are at work here, or if I can look at a facial expression, maybe I'll be able to articulate what muscle is being uh, worked upon or, or activated. Uh, so that's kind of it for facial expression. We'll get into innervation of these uh, actually now. <laughs>
So let's go ahead and take a look at the nerves of the head. So there's three primary nerve groups that we like to look at for the head, and we'll get into each of these in a little more detail. Now, given the way that the head is organized, um, I'm gonna start very superficially and we'll work our way deeper. So we're actually gonna come back to a lot of these nerves uh, later on. Probably not the cervical plexus because that's all just sensory in the scalp, um, but definitely the trigeminal and the facial nerve we'll see come up a couple of times. So as we're looking through this, if you start thinking, hey, wait, I thought the, sen the trigeminal nerve did this, uh, you're probably right, but we're gonna get to that a little bit later. So we're just gonna try to build on these concepts. So uh, the main sensory innervation to the face is the trigeminal nerve. The main motor nerve to the face, which is going to do all that musculature um, that we just looked at, is going to be our facial nerve. And then the cervical plexus is going to do sensory. And we kind of saw some of that before. Uh, it's pretty much sensory to the back of the head. All right, so let's start with the trigeminal nerve. This is cranial nerve five. And we'll actually divide this up into three components here. So we can call it, um, we can call it either their names. So the, the trigeminal nerve will break up into ophthalmic nerve. Uh, maxillary nerve and then mandibular nerve. You'll also see it identified as cranial nerve 5-1, cranial nerve 5-2, and 5-3, or B1, V2, V3. Those are all acceptable ways to name these. Uh, so if you were asked to identify them on an exam, I'd take either or um, whatever comes to mind first. So, so our trigeminal nerve will arise from our uh, lateral aspect of the pons there, and we'll take a look at those cranial nerves in a little more detail when we get to the, the brain. Um, but basically they all converge on a trigeminal ganglion and then it splits out into those respective divisions. So what we can see here is we got our trigeminal ganglion. So our nerve is already left. Our brain hits the ganglion and then it splits into our ophthalmic branch, maxillary branch, and then mandibular branch. Now, uh, I will kind of put in some spoilers that the only motor innervation that we're worried about with the trigeminal nerve is the muscles of mastication for chewing, but we'll get into those in another lecture. For now, just worry about the sensory of the face as supplied by the trigeminal nerve. And I also have to apologize. I have some stray stars, so feel free to just put anything else you want to memorize on those stars. They're kind of freebie. Um, but for your uh, purposes of exams, I tried to highlight the structures that you should be mindful of because there's a lot of subdivisions of these and a lot of them just aren't really high yield uh, worth knowing clinically speaking. So we'll start by taking a look at the ophthalmic nerve, which is going to be cranial nerve 5-1 or the um, first branch of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, and as you can see here, it also further, subsub further subdivides into three nerves, the frontal, uh, the nasal ciliary, and the lacrimal. Uh, the frontal is going to divide into a couple more that we'll worry about uh, as far as just identifying them and, and being mindful of their existence. The nasal ciliary does divide up a little bit. These help with um, some sensation uh, in the nasal cavity and kind of the lower eyelid, but I'm not too worried about these further subdivisions of the nasal ciliary. And then the lacrimal nerve um, associates with the lacrimal gland, so we'll take a look at that. But the ophthalmic nerve is going to be the smallest division of the cranial nerve, and it's the most superior. And the nice thing about these divisions is when we look at the face, uh, each one kind of separates the face into a three different compartments. So the upper part of the face, you'll be looking at ophthalmic nerve. The mid-central part of the face is maxillary. And then the final uh, lower end is going to be mandibular. So basically, if you're trying to divide it up, anything from the bridge in the nose to the superior eyelids up to the forehead is all going to be sensory innervation by your ophthalmic nerve. And then you can just kind of get into the details of the individual branches. So here's the ones that I kind of want you to focus on as far as what they do. Uh, and again, this is just sensory. We'll go into more detail about the trigeminal nerve and some of its other roles later, but this is just sensory distribution. So if someone were to ask you, you know, if you're not feeling sensation to a certain region of the face, what would the nerve be that might be affected? And so you can kind of just get comfortable with this. I'm not really so worried about the course, so the one thing we will look at when we look at the skull is that there's a various amounts of openings. Uh, the ophthalmic nerve is gonna leave its um, primary uh, portion of the skull through the superior orbital fissure, which we'll look at. It's kind of just an opening in the back of the orbit cavity. Um, but as far as the course for the rest of these, uh, if it helps you memorize what they're going to and what they do, uh, sure. But other than that, other, the only kind of courses I'll have anyone really be tested on is the exit points for these nerves or other structures uh, through various foramen in the skull. And again, I think that's lecture three. We'll take a look at that. All right, V2 is the maxillary nerve. So 
Again, we're going to get several divisions of that zygomatic infraorbital and the uh, pterygopalatine. Uh, I'm not so worried about these other divisions of the zygomatic as much, but just be mindful that they're there. There's going to be other micro divisions of the maxillary, but this is really just going to be the central portion of our face. So um, remember, we can call it uh, cranial nerve uh, 5 2 or V2. It's going to exit the skull at what's known as the foramen rotundum. And again, we'll look at those, and I have a nice chart broken down for how that would work. Um, but the infraorbital and the um, so basically, the zygomatic is anything associated with our cheeks. Infraorbital is just going to be below the eye, and the pterygopalatine is going to be kind of our nasal cavity region. So as you can Im imagine, uh, our sensory for basically just below our eyes to the upper part of our lip is all going to be provided by the maxillary nerve of the trigeminal, or I should say the maxillary branch of the trigeminal. Both are acceptable. And again, I've kind of broken this down. Uh, looks like I got that cut off. Not so worried about the coursing. But the ones I really want you to focus on there are the maxillary nerve and the infraorbital. Um, and really, that's just going to give you sensory to uh, right underneath the eyes. And we'll see there's an infraorbital foramen, so right underneath the orbits, uh, all the way up to your um, upper lip region. And that should be maxillary nerve innervation. And then finally, mandibular nerve, uh, or V3, as we can call it. Um, now, this one is uh, going to be sensory to the lower part of our face. And like I said, it's also going to do motor innervation to uh, the muscles of mastication that we'll look at shortly, uh, I believe, in the next lecture. Um, now, the muscles of mastication don't really have named uh, nerve fibers, so don't stress about those. Those will just be muscle to um, masseter and things like that. Uh, but the sensory ones do have names, so you should be comfortable with these ones. And this is going to be the largest branch, and the, we'll see that the mandibular nerve um, is one of the easier nerve fibers to see when you're looking at uh, dissected images um, in the infratemporal region, uh, kind of just underneath or right around where your uh, uh, TMJ is. Um, the nerve itself is going to exit the skull at the foramen of alley. Uh, just know that now, kind of put that word in there, uh, stick a pin in it for the time being. And when we look at the skull, uh, you can start making these associations. But this is going to be all inferior, so pretty much everything from the lower region of your lip to your chin is all going to be sensory innervation from your uh, mandibular nerve, part of that trigeminal. So the main branches that we'll look for are the auricular temporal, which is going to be a lateral aspect going on the side of the head, buccal towards the buccal region, which is kind of our cheekal region, uh, just below the zygomatic, lingua, lingua, sensation to the tongue, and uh, inferior alveolar will be sensory to um, your teeth uh, and regions like that. So alveolar is usually associated with um, your mandible or the uh, alveolar ridge where our teeth are embedded. Um, and like I said, we're not going to worry about motors and motor innervation at this point, but that will all come from our mandibular nerve as well. Uh, so the ones to be mindful of, you, you can just kind of make associations of where these uh, structures will go. This is all sensory innervation. So again, this is not autonomic nerve fibers, uh, although there will be things like parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers running with these. Um, what these uh, this chart is basically showing you here is just sensory innervation. So when you touch things and, and feel stuff, when you eat ice cream that's too cold on your teeth, um, knowing that those are, oh, my inferior alveolar nerve is acting up. So um, just be mindful of those uh, destinations. Okay, so that's it for the sensation from uh, mandibular nerve. Next, we'll take a look at the cervical plexus. So the nerves from C1 to C2 make up that. Um, but the ones that we're more worried about come from C2 and C3, dorsal and ventral rami. Uh, and really, this is just going to be sensory innervation to the back of the head. Um, and so we saw that. We, I remember we saw the, um, the greater occipital kind of coming back and running to the back of the head there. Uh, I guess you can see here, just running up through that um, suboccipital triangle. Uh, and so these, you just be mindful of the four major nerves that we deal with, uh, and you can kind of get their estimated uh, location points here. So we know that our greater occipital and uh, third occipital are going to be the back of the head, and the side are going to be more of our um, uh, greater auricular, and our lesser occipital are kind of kind of go up the lateral aspect of the head there. Those are all just sensory innervations directly from the spinal cord. Um, and again, no motor innervation here. All right, so the facial nerve. Uh, is probably the most important nerve for the stuff we're talking about today because all those muscles of facial expression uh, don't happen if we don't have the facial nerve. And so the facial nerve is going to originate from our inferior pons to relatively close to our trigeminal, uh, and it's going to exit by the place called the styloid mastoid foramen. Uh, I don't have this one 
italicized, but again, when we get to the foramens of the skull, uh, we can start making these associations. But it does have a motor root. There's a sensory parasympathetic root uh, that'll actually help um, go to our uh, facial glands, basically our submandibular or sublingual uh, salivary glands. Um, but that's a different nerve structure altogether. Uh, it, it, the parasympathetic cord comes from the chordae uh, tympani, but all you need to worry about right now is there's a motor root that's going to supply to the various structures of those facial um, expression muscles. So uh, basically, um, actually it's probably just look easier to look at a picture. Uh, the easiest way to kind of memorize these is this kind of like reverse face, and let's see if I can do this without um, kind of mirrored image on this up here, but if I were to, uh, I'm just going to let the image do it here. <laughs> so uh, basically, if you were to take your hand and make your uh, pinky um, kind of the top part where your temporal muscle is, and then just go down, that'll show you the various coursing fibers of your facial nerve. Uh, and these, again, are all motor nerves. So you have to be mindful of, and if you were kind of noticing, there's a lot of nerves that are going to be similar to what we talked about uh, before. So a good example is uh, there's a mandibular nerve and a buccal nerve. Now these are branches of the facial nerve, so if you're asked to identify them or talk about them, you have to specify that they're coming from the facial nerve. So this is the buccal branch of the facial nerve, mandibular branch of the facial nerve, not the mandibular nerve, because we saw that uh, coming off the trigeminal, and that's not the buccal nerve, because we saw that coming off of um, the mandibular nerve. But the easiest way to associate these, I don't necessarily exact, I don't ask you to uh, memorize what muscle goes with what fiber. Um, and the one we couldn't really see there is the posterior orbicular. That's actually going to kind of rise up um, sort of right along the, the back here around the ear uh, posteriorly. I can't reach. <laughs> so, uh, but think posterior orbicular, orbicular is ear, posterior behind the ear. Uh, so that's going to be one of the first branches that go up. But the thing that's interesting about these fibers is they all arise underneath our parotid gland. Okay, so they, we call that the parotid plexus. These fibers come out from underneath. And so if you're looking at a cadaver, the easiest thing to do is find your parotid gland first. It's going to be this lobulated uh, glandular looking structure. There'll be a nice thing coming out we'll talk about in a moment called the parotid duct, which may look like a nerve, but it's going to be really big. And these facial nerves don't tend to be super, um, super big. Uh, so that'll come help orient you. And then you just name them in association to where they are on the face. So temporal is going to be the side of the head. Zygomatic is kind of where your zygomatic arches, so the top of your cheek. Buccal is the side cheek region. Mandibular, right on the mandible. And then cervical is just going to be underneath the mandible towards your neck. Um, and that's kind of the course. Uh, for identification purposes, you, you need to have points of reference for these. So you never just, um, and this is always tricky too when doing things in the lab, uh, because sometimes these nerves get cut. And if you don't have a point of reference to see all the nerves and be able to tease out which one is where, uh, you can't just know where they're going to, especially when you start getting in the mid-region where like your buccal and zygomatic kind of blend together and you kind of want to have something to say like, okay, here's my most superior aspect, which is temporal. Now I can kind of count down uh, for the remaining ones. So here's your branch out. Uh, so know the nerves, know their names. As far as distribution goes, you should just, if you know where they're going to and you know your facial expression muscles, you should be comfortable enough to say like, okay, that's probably going to be uh, a muscle you know, if it's, um, let's say if it's a temporal muscle uh, going up towards the top of the head, right? So now we want to make sure we're dealing with muscles that are above the supraorbital region. Uh, and you contrast that to something that's mandibular uh, from the mandibular branch, we're dealing with muscles that are going to be in the lower aspect of our uh, jaw, right? So all our depressor muscles and even our rosorius are going to be um, motor innervated by our, uh, our mandibular branch of the facial nerve. Um, so just remember, the, the key takeaway here is don't necessarily focus on what muscle gets what. Know their regions, and I think you can tease those out. Um, I don't think I'm going to test you specifically and say, like, oh, the, um, the buccinator is innervated by what nerve? I mean, I would hope you know that that's the buccal nerve of the facial. Um, but, again, I don't think there's any real need to associate it. You kind of got the, the basics of where these structures are heading to. Uh, and the key thing is when you're identifying them, make sure you call it the branch of the facial nerve. So that's the motor nerves. Don't often have, um, especially in the region, don't have specific names. You just kind of call them branches of the main nerve, uh, not to be confused with the stuff we saw with the, the trigeminal nerve there. Uh, a couple of clinical correlates. 
Uh, so I don't know if anyone's ever noted any, known anyone with Bell's palsy. Uh, Bell's palsy is when you get any sort of paralysis to the facial nerve or may sometimes resulting from damage. Uh, it could happen during surgery. Uh, if people have, um, you can get things called uh, um, acoustic neuromas where you have to, they kind of can impede, especially when you're going for surgery. Uh, they can grow off of your uh, ganglion there. And when they go in, sometimes they're worried about damaging your facial nerve uh, region. And if that's the case, what happens is you usually just have paralysis of part of your face. Um, and so Bell's palsy really just kind of manifests as sort of like half the face is just non-active. Um, so I had a friend with this, and he, even though he recovered, sometimes it was just a, um, uh, a spontaneous case uh, and not many known cause. Sometimes you can get injury, sometimes it can be infection, but uh, if it's, it's hopefully something like, sometimes it'll clear up. Um, but he still has residual, just kind of a droopiness to him, even though everything seems to work normal. But it can be very um, interesting to see, I guess, to say the least, uh, because you just notice when a person's trying to communicate or smile or something, half their face just doesn't seem to be responsive at all, uh, where the other half is doing what you would expect. So um, that's known as Bell's palsy, any sort of paralysis of the facial muscle. And if it's bilateral, then you lose complete control. Uh, those are all muscles of facial expression, so it just becomes difficult to... Um, express yourself. Uh, usually it doesn't impede any sort of um, uh, daily activity like chewing, which is going to come from our masticator muscles of the trigeminal uh, nerve. Uh, so let's go into a little more detail about the parotid gland. So the parotid gland is going to be that structure that's going to help us identify where the facial nerve is. Uh, and so that's going to be the biggest salivary gland we have. And a lot of the salivary glands, um, if you saw in the neck region, we had the submandibular one kind of hanging below our mandible there. Um, we also have sublingual, which is going to be below the tongue, but the parotid is a nice big one on the cheek, and usually you can find it just anterior to your ear. There's going to be this glandular structure here, and if we go underneath it, you'll start seeing those, um, the uh, um, facial nerve um, plexuses coming out from underneath. So it's nice when you're dissecting or when you're looking in a lab because it kind of provides a buffer. Um, but these glandular structures tend to be kind of, um, they are protected by this parotid sheath, so it's slightly capsulated but it's also kind of uh, loose, uh, if that makes sense. Basically, it's just sort of there, and it's easy. It's hard to find the exact border ending, um, and so trying to dig around that can be tricky sometimes, uh, especially when you're trying to isolate out individual uh, nerve fibers. But the goal is, once you find the parotid, you should be able to identify your uh, facial nerve structures from there. Uh, additionally, coming from there is a parotid duct, so I mentioned that. It's basically going to be the duct that brings that salivary gland uh, um, serous, uh, sorry, salivary gland serous fluid into your mouth for digestion. Uh, it can be mistaken for a nerve, but uh, personally I think it's usually too big uh, and it's a little too floppy. So you usually just see that coming from the anterior aspect and kind of diving down towards the mouth uh, there. Uh, and that parotid duct is a, a good marking point too because you'll see this nice dominant structure heading towards the oral cavity and it will usually help you find the parotid gland which will just be lobulated. Uh, structure. So here's kind of a nice cartoon uh, aspect of this. Um, the parotid gland itself, so sensory innervation is going to be by uh, the um, auricular temporal and the greater auricular nerves, but it also gets parasympathetic, parasympathetic fibers from the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, and what we'll see is those actually come from what's known as the otic ganglion. So there's several ganglion uh, in the head region that we're concerned with uh, for parasympathetic innervation. And in this case, the otic ganglion and it's going to convey our, um, so presympathetic fibers are going to go to the ganglion, and then postsympathetic parasympathetic fiber, postsynaptic parasympathetic fibers are going to come from the otic ganglion uh, and then get into the parotid gland. And that'll help increase salivation, salivary, I guess salvation uh, is the word I would use. Um, and then uh, that's pretty much it for the parotid gland. So, a couple of things that to make note with the parotid gland, again, I'm not going to test you on these clinical correlates, just um, only in the context of what uh, anatomy is impacted, is um, you can get parotid gland cancer. And the problem with that is because there's not really a defined capsule, you can see how these tumors just sort of become uh, amorphous and just start expanding. Uh, but these can be pretty bad cancers and quickly spread to your um, your cervical lymph nodes. Uh, cancer known as mucal epidermoid carcinoma is the most common malignancy of the parotid gland. Again, you don't aren't expected to know that, just kind of like a nice dinner table fact. But um, 
And that's one thing you can get. More commonly, you'll see things like parotiditis uh, or saladentitis, things like that, or any sort of infections of your salivary glands. And so what can happen is any sort of infection can lead to swelling. And what could eventually happen is you start uh, causing a reaction to block off your parotid duct. And this blockage can create what's known as a silith. So I'm finding my hands here, um, which basically can be uh, prevent any sort of in, in allowance of salivary gland uh, fluid into the mouth. Uh, it can be quite painful. Uh, you'll actually just kind of feel that the area around that um, swollen gland will start becoming tender and um, very uncomfortable, uh, especially when you're trying to eat because now you're just kind of uh, utilizing your um, mastication muscles, which are all right around your parotid gland. And so that can be quite painful. But uh, so that's it for the nerves of the face. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the vasculature. So let's go ahead and take a look at the vasculature of the head. And again, this is just going to be superficial vasculature, uh, as there's a lot more stuff we'll look at as we get into the deeper layers of the face uh, and inside the skull. So the superficial arteries of the head are pretty much all derived from the external carotid artery. So in the neck lectures, you would have seen the common carotid divides into the internal carotid and the external carotid. And the external carotid is pretty much supplying everything we are going to need to keep our face going. All those muscles that we looked at, uh, all those structures, the parotid gland, things like that, are all supplied by the external carotid, with the exception of the <clears throat> with the exception of the ophthalmic artery, which is going to be supplied by the internal carotid once it goes into the brain. And so we'll see a couple branches coming off from that. Um, but 90-95% of the uh, superficial arteries that we're going to look at are all external carotid arteries. So here you can see a nice little picture. Um, <clears throat> and I tried to identify the ones, the stars here are indicating ones that come from the ophthalmic artery. Uh, but everything else you'll see here are going to be um, external carotid arteries that you can see. And our external carotid is actually going to go up and branch off at this point. The terminal branches are going to be our uh, maxillary artery and our superficial temporal artery. So once you get to this point where it kind of branches off, um, that's where our external carotid stops and we get our uh, maxillary, which we'll look at when we get to the infratemporal fossa, it's going to kind of supply a lot of our deep structures and our superficial temporal artery is going to supply the lateral aspect of our uh, scalp there. So here's the arteries that I want you to kind of focus on and these ones you should be mindful of where they're coming from and where they're going to. Um, and so the biggest ones are once we, um, I say, oops, let me go back here. Uh, the, probably the biggest one to know is that facial artery that comes off uh, kind of early on. So you would have saw a lot of your um, structures from the, uh, the neck uh, coming off of that common carotid. And then once we split, probably the first one I would focus on is our facial. And the facial is really uh, nice to identify because it's very curly. Uh, it's got this nice little curly Q look to it. And you can kind of see it like wrap down or under the mandible and then come back up. And it gives a lot of our structures, uh, primarily our labial arteries, so superior and inferior labials. Uh, and it goes up and supplies the nose. So really what happens is our facial artery comes up from the side here and really just kind of goes up towards the nose, um, supplying everything from our lips and our uh, nasal passages there. Uh, so you have your inferior labial, superior labial, lateral nasal is going to be kind of the, the area that gets our ala of the nose. And we'll take a look at the nose in just a moment here. And then the angular artery is the one that's going to be on the lateral side there of the nose going up towards the, the bridge. Okay. The other branch to be mindful of is the occipital artery, which is going to kind of come off and go towards the occipital region of the scalp. Um, so that's pretty much just going to supply all the structures in the back there, kind of do the same thing that we saw with their cervical plexus. It's just head that way. So that one you usually have to dig a little bit deeper, but if you see an artery going towards the back of the skull, typically you're going to think about it as being your, um, your occipital. Uh, a couple other ones to be mindful of is our posterior auricular. That's going to follow the same course as that posterior auricular nerve. 
which is coming off of our facial um, carotid plex or facial parotid plexus. Remember that one's going to be behind the ear, and so you'd see the same thing with our um, posterior auricular artery. Superficial temporal and the maxillary artery are going to be terminal branches. Like I said, we'll focus on the maxillary shortly when we get into the deeper structures of the face, but for now, uh, superficially speaking, the only terminal branch of the external carotid we're worried about is that superficial temporal artery. Uh, a couple other ones to be mindful of is the mental artery. So what we'll see is uh, actually the inferior alveolar artery, which is a branch of our uh, maxillary artery, is going to kind of come disappear for a little bit, and then it's going to pop out through a mental foramen in the uh, chin. And then once it pops out of there, that inferior alveolar artery becomes the mental artery. And so you won't really see that kind of branching out, but you'll see that kind of in an anterior aft aspect of our uh, chin here. And then, uh, like I mentioned too, the only ones that are going to be slightly different are the infraorbital, um, sorry, the superorbital uh, branches um, and the supertrochular. I'm not too worried about those uh, as far as identifying. The one that you should be able to identify is the superorbital because we have a superorbital foramen uh, above the eye and an infraorbital foramen below the eye, and you'll see the vessels coming right out of those, and those would be the best place to identify those. Uh, and they follow the same course as the corresponding nerves as well. Okay, so let's take a look at the veins of the head. Um, now you may have noticed this in the neck region. The veins in the head and neck tend to have a lot more collateral blood flow. There's a lot more redundancy and connected vessels. So I won't emphasize these as much. There's only a few that I'm really worried about in this region, and I highlighted those here. So just be mindful, uh, particularly the ones I'm more interested in are their facial, superficial, temporal, uh, and then the fact that um, the retromandibular kind of becomes this bridging point where we saw the external carotid uh, artery become our superficial temporal and our um, uh, maxillary artery. Uh, the reverse for the veins is we see those two vessels merge and become the retromandibular, uh, and that will merge with our facial uh, vein to become our external jugular. So uh, as long as you're comfortable with the bolded structures here, I think you're fine. Even then, I won't go super in depth uh, as far as testing. Um, you really just be mindful of the path that they follow. So your angular vein is going to do the anterior aspect of your face. Your superficial temporal is going to be do, doing the lateral skull. And then just that junction before we get into the jugulars. So let's go ahead and finish up with the nasal cavity and the nose. So externally speaking, the nose is pretty straightforward. It's kind of a, a main uh, function is an olfactory as well as breathing. Uh, and what it does is there's these um, hairs in there. So our little nasal hairs, our, our vibrace, uh, are actually going to help filter air and helps warm air as we get in. So most of our breathing is done through our nasal cavity, uh, passive breathing, I should say. So when, after working out, yeah, you'll get a little bit of a huff and puff through the mouth, kind of really intake that oxygen. But just passively sitting there, we should all just be breathing through our nose. Um, and that's going to help filter the air, make sure none of that dust particle gets kind of sent down to our lungs where it shouldn't be. It's going to make sure the air is warm. So if we've got a nice cold day and you know you breathe in real quick, our nose kind of gets that tingly cold sensation. Um, and then additionally, as fibers kind of go in there, our olfactory bulb from our cranial nerve, uh, cranial nerve one, is going to be kind of sitting there at the top of our nose and help kind of picking up those fibers and help us uh, smell things. So that's kind of the main function of the nose. Uh, but externally speaking, all the stuff that we see externally is going to be cartilage. So a lot of this stuff doesn't maintain in the skull feature. So here's a nice skull again. You can see our nose has got that kind of uh, sort of cutaway look to it compared to our normal nose, which is usually prominent. But uh, most of that structure is based off cartilage coming out from the, the external uh, surface there. Uh, internally speaking, our nasal cavity is going to be made up of um, basically the area between our uh, anterior fossa of the skull, which we'll see when we open up the skull. It's kind of the, if you think about your superorbital ridge here, if you were to follow that back, so my brain's up here, superorbital ridge starts here. This is a nice little cubby where the brain sits, and that's our inter anterior fossa. Uh, so that's going to be marking the top point, uh, and we'll see the bottom point is going to be our oral cavity there. 
so if we're going to define the boundaries of our nasal cavity, uh, our top part, as far as uh, bones go, is going to be portions of our nasal bone, uh, as well as some of the cartilage up here, our ethnoid um, bone, and then this body of our uh, sphenoid bone, which we'll take a look at as we get into the skull components. Laterally speaking, we have our ethmoid bones, and those are going to give off these uh, nasal conches, which we'll see which can be bony projections that will also be covered in the mucosa. Uh, inferiorly, it's going to be the um, palate process of our maxilla and the palate uh, palatine bones, and then um, medially we have our nasal septum. So each nasal cavity, our nasal cavity is divided into essentially two equal parts separated by a nasal uh, septum. So if we're looking at our image here, you can easily see the, um, at least the internal components, we can't see the cartilage and stuff, but you see our concha coming off the ethmoid bone, you can't really see our palatine process from the inferior aspect or the top part of our ethmoid bone. You can see our vomer and perpendicular plate making up the bony structure to the septum. So we'll go ahead and take a look at those in a little more detail. So when we look at the nasal septum, so like I said, we're going to have two relatively equal nasal cavities, and the dividing point is this nasal septum. And there's two bony components and then one cartilaginous component. So the cartilaginous component is simply the septal cartilage, you can call it, uh, but the bony part is a, what's known as the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, and then its own bone or the vomer, which is kind of its own bone here, right? So those two are going to be in the posterior aspect. And if we go back to our skull, that's exactly what you see here. Perpendicular plate up top in red, and then the vomer is going to be green on the bottom here. Okay, so that makes up our nasal septum. It's going to divide the nasal cavity into two equal halves. When we look at the lateral aspect of each uh, nasal cavity half, uh, we have what's known as these nasal concha, or turbinates. You can use either term interchangeably. Um, so the key is knowing the difference between a nasal concha slash turbinate and your nasal meatus. So on the side here, these ethmoid bone projections are going to be, um, or these bony projections are going to be our nasal concha. And you can kind of see, the, and concha basically just kind of indicates that it's like a, a shell. So if you think of like a little shell, it's got a little curly Q to it. Um, and it's actually going to be covered with mucosa here. But the space underneath that, so if we were to kind of like get under there with our, our hand or sort of look underneath, put like a little uh, probe or something in there, you'd actually see this space. So the, the curvature of the, the shell-like structure um, kind of wraps around, but underneath it creates this little cavity or space, and we call that a nasal meatus. Um, and so uh, these are kind of the main uh, functional regions of our nasal cavity, and we'll see this equally on the left and right side, so there should be the same thing. So the goal of these meatuses is, is they provide a source for drainage. So the conches themselves are just going to be those, um, those curly parts, right, the actual projections. But the meatuses are actually these spaces. So when we identify our meatus, we have a superior, so again, let me find my hand here. We have a superior, middle, and inferior. Inferior is usually the biggest and the easiest to see. And if we go back to our frontal cavity here, you usually can't see the superior in just the frontal view of the bone. So the, middle, the inferior is really straight and forward and easy to see, followed by the middle. Uh, but the superior tends to be a little bit smaller, kind of tucked away in the posterior aspect of our, um, behind our middle. But the goal of these meatuses, or meatuses, meatuses, is basically a drainage site. Uh, so we'll take a look at our um, uh, nasal sinuses in just a moment. But what's happening is these nasal sinuses that are going to be basically spaces in our skull, they can fill up with fluid because they're covered with mucosa and they start kind of secreting their... Um, uh, mucus and, and lubricating material to kind of keep our, uh, our uh, mucus membranes um, pliable, uh, that needs to go somewhere. And so uh, you should be comfortable with which, which drainage site is which. So our superior meatus receives drainage from our ethmoid sinuses. Our middle meatus is going to receive drainage from our maxillary sinuses, which are some of the more prominent ones on the lateral aspect. Our inferior sinus or meatus is going to receive um, uh, drainage from our uh, lacrimal duct. So uh, the lacrimal duct is basically our, our um, where our tears go. So our lacrimal gland will create the tears or help kind of lubricate our eye. Uh, and when we produce too much, um, that'll just kind of get drained. And so our eye that normally is kind of lubricated and smooth, uh, all that fluid kind of just rinses off and makes its way to the inferior meatus, which normally we don't think about. But uh, if you've ever been to a point where you're booger crying, uh, what's happening is you're crying so much, a lot of that tear structure is actually getting into your inferior meatus um, and just building up. So that's why you get a lot of nasal drippage as well. 
Uh, another one that I'm not too worried about because it's kind of its own little space is this phenolethanoid um, recess. Uh, and this is just a small space um, behind the superior uh, concha and it kind of allows for the sphenoid sinuses to drain. Um, it's really hard to see. You can kind of see it back here. I don't think this image is really good, but it basically be just around here. And our sphenoid sinuses are a little more um, smaller located. Uh, let's see, no, I don't have a good image of it. It's not one that I really would test you on. I want you guys to be more comfortable with uh, the superior, middle, and inferior. But here's a nice uh, coronal view of both of them. So again, you can see, if we're looking at frontal view, how small that superior concha is. But the meatus is just the space in between. So you can see how it just kind of creates that little like semi shell shape. And then the meatus is where everything drains into. So just be, be mindful of those terms and try not to mix them up. Um, oh, here we go. So here's the showing of the, uh, et the epnoid. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong PowerPoint. Uh, here's a showing of that ethnoid, um, a sphenoid ethnoid recess uh, kind of draining in there. So there's our sphenoid. Um, sinus just dripping in close to our superior uh, meatus. But again, I'm not worried about that one so much if you know the big three. And this is just kind of a demonstration of where those openings would lie uh, for our sinuses. As far as vascularization of the nasal cavity goes, uh, not too much to worry about. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of all these individual arteries, just knowing where they come from. So a lot of it just comes down to the fact that if you kind of know your basic anatomy, um, these structures make sense, right? So uh, if you think about what um, the top part of our nasal cavity, which is gonna be just kind of in the infraorbital region, we get our uh, ophthalmic artery kind of giving some tributaries for our eth those anterior and posterior ethmoid. And so I'll show those here. So those are coming off of our um, ophthalmic on the superior aspect, where the inferior aspect and most of the aspect of our um, vasculature is actually gonna be coming from our maxillary artery here. So I don't expect you to know the individual names but you should be uh, familiar with the fact that your blood supply will come from the ophthalmic and the maxillary as uh, um, divisions of those. Uh, venous, venous drainage is really just a combination of plexuses. Like I said, that's very common in the head region. And so we just kind of see a network of veins sort of uniformly draining uh, into either uh, our, um, our uh, sinuses in the skull, or we can actually meet up with uh, like our angular and facial vein uh, and eventually drain the face that way. So um, that's kind of it for those. Uh, innervation, again, I won't get into crazy detail about the individual nerves, but you can do kind of just be mindful of where those nerves come from. Uh, again, very similar. So if you're comfortable knowing that the ophthalmic and the maxillary uh, arteries give off um, arterial supply, well, the maxillary and the ophthalmic nerves give off nerve supply. So um, I did highlight uh, nasal palatine and greater palatine, mostly because you'll probably see those names come up. Realistically, I don't expect you to know those, um, but real, just knowing like, okay, my uh, top part uh, with my ethmoid region, let will show those here, uh, top part with the ethmoid region are pretty much all coming from our uh, ophthalmic, and then a bulk of the um, portion basically around our upper lip and uh, palatine process there is coming from our maxillary nerve uh, innervation. And then of course the olfactory nerves are in their skull. Uh, you'll actually see these kind of situated and you can kind of get a good image here. The olfactory bulb uh, sends its nerve fibers down into the top and basically just kind of saturates the upper part of your nasal cavity and that's where our sense of smell uh, will come from. So those things basically get triggered. So you'll get into more discussion of that when we talk about the cranial nerves, but just be mindful that those are your kind of your main nerves of interest when we're talking about the nasal cavity. So again, let's, uh, quick little review is uh, olfactory nerve for the sense of smell and then just uh, sensation is going to be done by the ophthalmic and the maxillary nerves uh, depending on what region of the nasal cavity we're in. So paranasal sinuses, I alluded to these before, you should be comfortable with the main types. So we have a frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, sphenoid sinus, and ethmoid sinus. Uh, the good news is these are just named for the bones that they're found in. So if we go and look at the images here, I, I kind of like the one uh, right here is all color coded. Um, so our maxillary sinuses tends to be one of the big ones that's in pink. You can see that just in our maxilla bone, they're just these big spacious cavities um, in the, the skull, just kind of a uh, developmental thing. Um, our frontal is gonna be in the frontal bone up top. And then in the back, you get these ethmoid sacs. So these are like really small um, partial sinuses. And then in 
that general area as well. You can't really see it on the side view here. Your sphenoid sinus is going to be located in your sphenoid bone. Um, that one is the main difference between uh, ethmoid and sphenoid is the ethmoid has all these little pocketed sacs here. So uh, if you were to look at a cross section or something like that, you should be able to identify that. But they are kind of in that same um, uh, midline plane of the body. Uh, but here's a great view. Yeah, so this side view is much better. So the pink or the yellow here is your um, sphenoid. Ethmoid here with those sacs, frontal, and then maxillary. So th these are just kind of cavities. They are aligned with mucosa um, and they kind of create spaces. Overall, it's just sort of the development of the bone. They can lead to problems. Uh, and we'll take a look at those in just a moment. But here you can see uh, an x ray view or CT scan of them as well. Uh, I won't really test you on those um, per se uh, unless I give you some sort of context. Uh, so just be mindful that. Uh, you'll see these empty spaces on a imaging, whether it's CT or x-ray, and those are corresponding to our sinuses. Um, so usually what I might do is do like a side-by-side -side, uh, view of that. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few clinical correlations, and we'll call it a day on this first lecture. Uh, so sinusitis is um, something that we may have all kind of experienced in our time. Uh, so this is really just chronic infl inflammation in the nasal cavity. And what happens is we saw that there's communication between those sinuses and your nasal cavity. Sometimes those in, um, infections can kind of work their way, way retrograde uh, into those sinus cavities and basically cause blockage. And so what happens is this fluid starts to build up and becomes like a nice little bacterial bath in your sinus with no real easy escape because your swollen mucosa is basically blocked off your, um, your exit points and the meatuses. And so you basically just kind of get this uh, intense pain. And so people get like sinus headaches or usually have some sort of blockage that they need to go in and fix. Um, there are cases where um, you can actually get something that semi is semi-life-threatening because of these sinuses basically create this cesspool of growth. Um, <clears throat> one of the most prominent ones that is uh, really life-threatening is something called mucomycosis. It's a fungal infection. And once that takes root in the sinus cavity, uh, you have to work really fast because it can rapidly multiply and make its way into the brain quickly and cause um, serious defects, if not death, uh, in the long term. So sometimes you'll see uh, in hospitals, if someone's worried about mucor, uh, what they're talking about is a fungal infection kind of in your nasal sinuses. Uh, so I have to just make sure that gets uh, um, uh, treated properly. Uh, nasal fractures. Um, so I actually should have put a, a picture of uh, Owen Wilson on for this one, uh, that classic like bent nose. So most of your um, prominent features in your nose are cartilage, uh, which is flexible, more flexible than bone, but can still break here. And so in this case, what we've actually seen being broken is our nasal bone and then the cartilage as well. So uh, just because of the nature of where our uh, nose sits, it is kind of rigid. Um, think doing things like falling over, uh, getting into a fight or something like that makes it very prone to basically some sort of um, fracture or injury or dysfunction, uh, not really dysfunction, like a misalignment, things like that. Um, usually what happens is because of the blood supply that we talked about, you'll get a, a what's known as epitaxis. Um, and usually it's pretty um, okay to live with. Uh, most of the time you're just going to damage up that cartilage. Um, and you can replace it or you might just get like a prominent like twisty nose and you can see this in a lot in boxers You've been boxing for a while. They have this like kind of shifted nose structure as their cartilage just doesn't quite uh, Replace itself the same way that bone would um, in advanced uh, injuries uh, Our perpendicular plate and our bone work can actually start cracking and that can cause issues as well uh, And also might lead to some blockage. So sometimes they actually have to go in and actually remove some of the septum because it is uh, What we'll look at now is deviated and so what happens is in a deviated septum, you can start impinging on your meatuses again. And we already talked about that with sinusitis, whereas if we start doing that, then ultimately that can lead to blockage and that becomes a cesspool for bacterial infection. And so a lot of times what they'll do is actually go in and remove the nasal septum or they might like open up the sinuses a little more. So um, in the pathology assistant world, we get things called sinus contents. And this is a go in and kind of like chip away the bone and try to open those sinus cavities up a little bit more so that they can essentially breathe uh, easily. Um, but in cases of uh, nasal fractures, sometimes the septum can be causing that problem. So you actually have to remove the septum as well. And it usually doesn't have any, um, you can keep some of it intact. It doesn't have any uh, long-standing uh, clinical implications. Uh, but if you have to remove the entire septum, uh, it can have problematic uh, issues with breathing and things like that. 
So that is it for head one. Uh, I know that was a bit of a longer lecture, but um, kind of getting the, the footprints down. But I will uh, meet up with you again for head two. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, and thank you for joining me.